Hi, everyone. I'm really excited you're joining us today because I'm here with David Tisch, the managing partner at Box Group and the co-founder of Spring. Thanks so much for joining us, David. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to, uh, to chat. So I want to start out a little bit differently today. I want to pretend Uh-oh. that we're switching roles. And I almost wore a hoodie and a hat because I know you like to wear that. So let's say I'm an investor and we're in New York and you're coming, David. You're a young founder and you have this great idea for Spring. You're coming to pitch me. I know you're big on the whys, so why should I invest in Spring? Why is Spring different? I think there's um, there's probably two reasons to to think about the company differently than than what's out there. Um, the first is we're a tech first company, and so there are very few e-commerce companies that have put tech at the forefront and product at the forefront of what they're doing, and instead put commerce at the forefront. And so we've we've taken a totally different approach. Um, we don't believe that e-commerce should be a utility. We think it should be an experience, and that's the way that we're building Spring. And so from that standpoint, it's a totally differentiated approach to how we're building this company from other commerce companies in the past. And I think the the second one, which speaks to the, the size of the opportunity, is that the business model uh, that we're going after is totally differentiated. It's a straight marketplace model. And so um, we don't hold inventory. We don't ever hold inventory. We don't have to deal with e-commerce logistics. Instead, what we're doing is we're working directly with our brand partners and um, they are selling directly to consumers. And what comes with that is a direct-to-consumer channel. And so we're able to be price disruptive from the supply side and that we're giving our brand partners uh, incredible margins that they're only able to capture through their own channels through our third party channel uh, and that's a totally different business model than any of the other aggregators have taken. Great, so I know the first thing you look at as an investor is a team. So I know you co-founded this with your brother Alan. What is it like working with him? Yeah, so it's it's myself, it's Alan, uh, my brother, who's seven years younger. It's our our third co-founder is a guy named Octavian uh, VV. We call him. He uh, he spent six years at Google, and so from a technical standpoint, um, he's pushing the limits of of our tech team. And our fourth co-founder, Ara, uh, brings a storytelling marketing background. And so I think the the most important thing is we're a re- well-rounded team, um, a founding team, and, and as we've scaled, continuing beyond that. And uh, in terms of working with my brother. Um, it's fascinating because every single challenge that you've ever had in a non-work situation, so whatever my brother's done at home, whatever I've done at home that bothers him, now shows up at work <laughs> because you're like, I know you do that with mom, I know you do that with dad, stop doing that at work. Um, and so there's this extra dynamic that that I think is, is you know, comes from the familiarity of, of growing up together and um, I think it gives you this, you know, insane amount of trust in that um, you know, you need you need that dynamic and the trust at the senior level of, of any company at the founding team, and uh, we clearly have that. Um, but it also adds complexity because you have a, a lot of baggage that comes with that that trust. You've spoken, David, just a moment ago about how Spring is very direct. It's almost like Instagram for shopping, and I learned about it in the summer. And I'm not a big shopper, so I, when I got on. I was very surprised that I could not get off of it. Whether it's the design or the new brands that I'm learning about or even your emails, I mean, it's not very often today that there's an email subject line, stay in bed for the Sunday scroll, that actually makes me stay in bed. What's your strategy to make this so alluring? Uh, thank you. Um, I think that the... The thing I said earlier is the most important piece is this is built around being an experience and not a utility. I think commerce apps have been built around get you in, give you what you need, get you out, and get it to you as quick as humanly possible. That makes sense for so many different uh, things that you need to buy. It doesn't make sense for discretionary purchases. And so discretionary purchases are going to happen because you feel like you want something, because Something catches your eye because you're window shopping, you're browsing, and you discover something that you want. And so we felt that we needed to put discovery and browse first. And so that's why we don't have search in the app. There's, we're not telling you, come here, know exactly what you want, get it and get out. We're instead saying, lean back and enjoy the process. And while enjoying that, if you happen to find something you want to buy, awesome. 
but that's not our expectation. Our expectation and the goal of the company is to create an experience that you want to open every day like you would a social app or like you would a content app. And I think that's the best part because as a 21 year old, my budget is not very big for shopping, but I've never been pressured to buy anything, not even we, uh, emails. And, and I think our, our goal is also to, to over time be better and better at customizing it to you. And so if you're only looking for certain stuff in a specific price point, we should be delivering you more of that stuff. At the same time, if you're inspired by stuff that costs uh, prices that you're just unable to afford, but still want to see that stuff, we're going to be able to deliver that to you as well. And I think that that, um, when we think about, again, our differentiation, it's the ability to be cross-price and cross-style as a true marketplace. And instead of picking a very specific price point or a very specific style and only buying and, and sort of selling stuff from within that one point of view, we've taken just a, a different approach to that. Great. And I know now the next chapter and big focus for you guys is going to be going international. Where do you want to go first? Ah, uh, we haven't figured. Uh, we haven't fully figured that out yet, or, or talked about it. But um, you know, I think I think as an e-commerce company, the the commerce piece that is most important is being able to to reach all potential customers and being accessible. And so, right now, we're on the iPhone only in the U.S. only. Uh, the next thing we'll be doing is is putting out an Android app web, desktop, mobile, web, uh, tablet, and international. And uh, those are the places where we naturally can expand to. And so you'll see that happen uh, beginning in, in early next year. Great. So I want to shift gears for a couple seconds and talk about your experiences at Box Group where you are today. I saw a tweet from you a few months back saying that you didn't want to receive any more cold emails. It was, a li- it was a little more nuanced. The more nuanced to that. And I've heard you talk about, you know, the right way to send an email, you don't want to get something that says "Dear Sir, Madame." That's clearly copy and pasted. Yeah, but I, th- I think that that's I think I think that that's my main point is um, you're looking for somebody to put in an effort, right? And and I'm not a bank. I'm, I'm not here to um, sort of do transactions. Um, and I think instead, I'm here to build relationships. And I, I'm not big on building relationships through transactional engagement. And I think that that's the the mistake that a lot of first-time founders make is they go out and instead of trying to build a relationship, they're trying to accomplish a goal. And um, I don't think that that's the right path, especially with me. Um, it might be for some other investors. I think as you go later on, it's still about relationship, but there's more data at least talked about. I think at this point, uh, at an early stage of a company, you're never going to prove something. And so it's about uh, building the relationship, building trust, and you have to do that in a very small amount of time and uh, in an intense way. And so, if a if a founder is unable to strike that interest right off the bat, they probably lost that interest. And you've spoken before about some tips on how to send a great email. What's going to make you, David? You're sitting on Sunday night. I know you shared Sunday's the best time to reach people, even though it's annoying. You're sitting. You're watching a Survivor rerun. What's going to make you pause the Survivor rerun and respond to someone's email? Um, so the, the answer isn't a specific answer, and that's the key, is there's no script. You have to win. You have to catch somebody's attention. You have to stop them in their tracks. So what's going to do that? Um, a fantastically funny email, a fantastically impressive email, a fantastically like beautiful email. And beautiful is probably involves a, a product shot or a link or something that you click and you just go, holy, like, gotta, gotta stop what I'm doing and pay attention to that. And so um, be great. And that's the answer is, is whatever it is that, that you're going to put forth is your skill. And some people aren't funny. Some people aren't um, poetic. And so if that's not your thing, don't focus on that. If, if that is and that's your strength, that's where you should focus the email or, or the pitch. And um, if it's a product that you've built that's beautiful and it's ready to, to show off, show it off. Don't make uh, somebody hunt for it. And I think that that's the most important. Are there a couple of pitches over the last few years that have really stood out to you? Every time we make an investment, it stands out to us. We, uh, we're, we're early stage investors. We invest in, uh, in about 40 to 50 companies a year. We're equally as excited every time we make an investment, and I think that that's the key. And so, when I'm asked what what am I most excited by, the last thing that I invested in, um, that's probably the answer. And there's obviously a whole portfolio that's growing and doing interesting things, but 
Um, our job as early stage investors is to get just as excited every time. And, and if not, almost more excited. Where if you look at a deal, you're like, I'm pretty excited, but not as excited as the last deal. You're probably not going to do that one. So it's almost that each deal you do has to be better than the last one from a, a excitement standpoint. Not a bad life. I, I love what I do. It's a, it's a good gig. So you've said, David, that a lot of times startups are rebellious, but founders end up conforming. How can you avoid that? Because the early stages, and I can attest to it completely, it's scary to not know the answer. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a trick here. I think that this is the hardest part about starting a company. Um, and, and there are no shortcuts to it. It's, it's a deep amount of conviction. It's a deep amount of confidence. It's a deep amount of, of thoughtfulness where um, every time you have an opportunity to hedge a bet in a, in a safe direction or in a direction that isn't what you believe in, you need to fight that. And you need to fight that feeling of, of taking um, a short-term uh, you know, a shortcut or um, compromising your big vision. And the challenge is sometimes your big vision is wrong or sometimes you're not good enough to execute your big vision and people might tell you that and even if that's the truth, you want to fight it and you want to try to prove that wrong and so there's very little that somebody should be able to say to you from the outside that stops you in your tracks. Now, the challenge is that um, not everybody's going to be successful and not everybody's great at and not everybody should be working on what they're doing and so there are times when you get that advice that it's probably right but... Um, who am I to tell you what those moments are? On that note, you've said it's important to grow in areas and learn in areas where you don't want to learn. And what's one place that was a challenge for you that maybe a couple of years ago you would have said, I don't think I'm going to do this. This is really hard. But when you dove in, it just completely changed how you work. Um, networking in general. Uh, so when I joined Techstars, um, before I was at Techstars, I was, I was in the New York tech scene and I had known a, a community of people, but it was small and it was slow and it was, I was really building uh, a network organically. And when I joined Techstars, um, the job was to go build a network. The job was to build a community. I prefer to be at home. I'm, I'm pretty introverted. I, I get socially awkward when I want to. Um, and I stepped into a job where that was the exact opposite of the role. I had to be extroverted. I had to be a community leader. I had to network professionally. Um, and so I had to not just do it, but I had to be great at it. And so when you step into those positions, um, you have to be aware that this is a challenge, but you also have to, to try to win. And so I didn't just go and, and fumble through it. I went and said, okay, I don't really want to do this. This isn't my favorite thing in the world to do. I feel uncomfortable, but if I'm going to do it, I better be good at it. And so um, that was the approach that I took there. What do you think is your best networking advice to a young founder who is shy? Build relationships uh, over the long term. And so um, did some Mark Suster uh, famous blog post that he put up of, of build lines, not dots. And um, the way you build lines is by creating a lot of dots. And so I think as a founder, it's again, it's staying away from being transactional and instead um, being able to, to build connections. And so if you're a founder that doesn't do well in big group situations or at events, um, don't force yourself to necessarily focus on that. Instead, create opportunities for one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm -hmm. um, now, what that doesn't mean is at an event, try to siphon off somebody for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's instead, put yourself in a position uh, to succeed. And I think that for every person, depending upon your personality, that, that's a very different scenario. I know you're going to bring a lot of this. You just signed on with Cornell to work with their startup studio. How do you see education changing to make it? One of the things I was disappointed with when I left school was there's not much about what it really means to start a company. How are you going to bring that to Cornell? I think what you're bringing is a framework for problem solving, a framework for thinking, a framework for um sort of understanding historically what has worked and what hasn't more than you're saying, here's the script to start a company. And I think that that's, um, I don't think what you're able to do is tell people how to do their, their company. I don't think what you're able to do is tell people how to run their business. I think what you're able to do is give people frameworks for how to think about problem solving. Um, and that's the goal as to what we're doing at Cornell is to um, put the students in a position to succeed versus 
give them a script as to how to succeed. I think that that's, that's impossible to do. What's the real version, David? I think a lot of times startups until you're in a startup are very glamorous. You had this idea and then it became Uber. Now you're a millionaire. What's the real story of what it's like to survive building a tech company? Deep, deep, deep uncertainty every minute of every day. You just have no idea. Like your numbers are your numbers. You don't actually understand how good they are, how not good they are, other than reading some random article on the internet and comparing yourself to something else. It, it's just all about fighting insecurity because you're early. You haven't uh, hit some hockey stick. It isn't all just organically working. You have to make huge decisions and huge bets on a daily basis without any real information as to what you're supposed to do. Nobody's telling you what to do. And so every single piece of it is is ripe with insecurity. And your job as a founder is to fight all of that and stay optimistic, be confident, lead, and put the company in a position to succeed one of the ways you can't do that is by not making decisions. And so you have to make decisions. You have to make a lot of decisions and you have to be quick to make those decisions. And, and, and the challenge is you don't know what, what the options are. You don't know what the outcomes could be. The decisions that you're making are being done in, in a very challenging environment, both to understand what you should do and what the outcomes uh, of those decisions are. And again, what does that breed in security? And, and uh, I think the key is that you have to fight it. You work with early stage startups every day, and I'm sure one of the biggest things they come to you with is that uncertainty to make decisions. What do you tell them when they need to go out and make the decision? In terms of what? So let's say I'm a founder in Box Group. I come and say, listen, I'm in between these three places to expand I don't know what to do. And you can kind of tell now I'm shrinking away. Maybe let's wait international till next year. What are you going to make me do to jump? Um, play out the scenarios. I think that that's the key is, is giving yourself a decision-making framework. And so what are the pros? What are the cons? What are the costs? What are the benefits of making this decision? And let's lay it all out there and see the options. And, you know, if the downside's limited, if the upside's incredible, and if the effort is uh, you know, little to uh, medium, it's a no-brainer and you make that decision. If, if those variables are changing in different directions, you start questioning things and um, trying to figure out if that is actually the right path. All right. So I want to end with two questions just about you. The uh -oh. first one, David, is what's one thing, and it doesn't have to be something super personal, of course, that nobody knows about you? I mean, I've said it. I've said it before, but I... Uh, I've, I've watched every episode of Survivor for you, you referenced it earlier, so I'll just tie that back. Is um, twenty nine seasons deep? I've never missed an episode, and so that's every years. single episode. Every single episode. So fifteen years of watching uh, a program on network TV without uh, without ever missing an episode, and um, I think it's a I think it's a fascinating sort of view of of how people behave in a very challenging, quirky. Uh, situation that I think translates a lot to business and so um, whether it's alliance building whether it's communicating with people that you don't really know in a very trustworthy situation uh, or trust dependent situation I think you and, and you're physically and mentally exhausted um, and emotionally you're insecure because you don't know the people around you it feels like a startup right it feels like it's uh, a lot like running a business and so I, I've learned a lot from watching that program over the past uh, 15 years very cool. So the last one is, how do you or will you define success? Because I know you love the early days, and then once a company starts getting big, you're ready for another challenge. Is there ever going to be a day where you sit back, David, and say, hey, I did what I came to do. I'm done now. Probably not. I but don't know. Um, I, I don't really, um, I don't think that far ahead in terms of, of putting targets out there. Instead, um, I would, I, it sounds amorphous or, or cheesy, but it's just do good work and, or do great work. And um, I think you need to look back on the portfolio of the work you're doing and feel like you've accomplished something that is, um, that is at the level of quality that, that you expected out of yourself. And I think that that's how I judge it is, um, did, did we do this 
at a level that uh, we'd be proud of. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Can we close with you sharing how people can stay up to date with Spring and Box Group? Sure. If you uh, if you follow Spring on Instagram or on Twitter, or just at Spring, uh, that's probably the best way to do it. And, and obviously, download the app if you're not in America or on an iPhone. Will be uh, will be available to you hopefully uh, in the near future. Uh, Box Group. Um, I don't know. Follow me on Twitter. We talk about stuff sometimes, but we're. Uh, We try not to be too loud about uh, the box group stuff and really let the companies that we work with shine. Great. Thank you so much, David. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great weekend.